Thanks very much. Uh, my only challenge here today is actually seeing my script, I should warn you, but due, due to my advanced years. So I'm Brian Catt, and I'm your science ambassador today. I have the badge to say so. Um, and I do schools as well, um, because it's what I do. We've much to cover. Um, some may come as a surprise. This is not a space, safe space for beliefs. If you value them, I suggest you leave now. <laughs> I've spent 64 years in engineering, physics, and business, so I always trust and verify. So should you. Um, I'll now describe the science, but I don't want you to believe me. I want you to think. Check out my, also, check out my 1,400 Clintel colleagues. Then, they're far more, far more eminent than I, include leading climatologists and engineers who really understand the science that politicians just don't. And thanks. the point is the client, sorry, the science says there is no climate emergency, but there is an energy emergency created in its name. Also now check out please the publications of Fair Fuel UK who are outside, Car 26 and and especially if you want some reading matter, the GWPF that Nigel Lawson started and Benny Pizer runs. And of course, the Reform UK party who are on this issue. All have helped my journey to this platform and I will join Fairfield UK outside in the exhibition hall afterwards to discuss the details of the things I now put up because we just haven't got time to go over them. Okay, could I have the second slide please? That's the first one. Right, I can't see that, but I've memorised it on the motorway on the way up. <laughs> There's a lot of data here, but I'm just going to tell you what it says. And the trick was to try and figure out how to do that. Down the bottom, on the right-hand side, are five ice ages, okay? I'll try and stay in the middle of these microphones. Five ice ages. Um, each one of the last four is hotter than this interglacial, sorry, the pink bit at the top of the peaks. That's where we are. The, the time we are talking about, the 10,000 years of our civilization, is that little pink rectangle on the top of the blue peak on the right-hand side. That's how significant we are in time and how things change in time. That's 10 degrees up and down roughly on that graph, okay? So um, moving over to the top left, this is IPCC, UN reality. And what you're seeing there is the basis of their models, which is there is no change until humans came along. So on all the bit from the left to the right until you see the, what's called the hockey stick, which is a one degree rise, is about a 0.2 degree shift. And they assume that there is no other change during that period. That's a rather crucial thing to discuss because if you now go to the bottom left, you will see temperatures from the um, Macassar Strait of Borneo. There, there are hundreds of papers that discuss the fact there is actually a cyclic change in climate. Um, that one's in Macassar Strait. It's going up and down 1.2 degrees every two, in 200 year bursts up, down, up, down over a few hundred years. That isn't what the IPCC see, of course, in their models. If you go to the top right, um, that's hard to describe, and I'll, <laughs> I'll just say, what it shows is that 1939 was pretty much as hot as it is now, okay? And um, what else does it show? If it, the next graph down shows that there was a medieval warm period before the Little Ice Age, so medieval warm period a thousand years ago is about temperature we have today, and the Roman period um, was a bit warmer than that. And in fact, the third graph down in that top right collection shows that we're parked just between the warmest it's been this interglacial and the coldest it's been this interglacial. So anybody who tells you that there's a hockey stick, it's the hottest it's ever been since records began, nonsense. No science says that, apart from the IPCC science and people who are actually well remunerated to produce hockey sticks, or hokey sticks as I prefer to call them. Um, so, where do we go now? Next slide, please. Where are we? Sorry, I'm trying to see. Oh, 
reality. <laughs> this is reality. Reality is what you get from satellites, not odd temperature stations stuck in funny places in airports around the world. But the oceans control the climate, but have a thousand times more heat in them than the atmosphere. Um, and they control the weather, of course. The land just modifies it a bit. So the best data comes from satellites, which are orbiting the Earth in a polar orbit while the Earth spins around underneath. So it gets very dense coverage across the whole of the oceans, and it's looking in the troposphere in particular, where these temperatures are, where the greenhouse effect should be as the, at its maximum. Now, if you look, you'll find uh, top left, the, now I really am on memory now, top left, that goes roughly from 1998 El Nino, which is the warm point you see there, to the 2016 El Nino, and there's another one after that. But basically, it's flatline from since 1998. So, but of course, that's not, that's not right, is it? Because we all know it's rising faster than ever. Um, if you go below, it's the same thing, only it goes back to when the records began in 1979. Um, oh, top right, if you're not into numbers, uh, of course, the other measure that we had were things that nobody could actually go and check for themselves. What pa Patrick Moore calls, what is it, invisible catastrophes. So, polar bears. Since records began, the current set of records is about two and a half times more than there were when they started. Um, the Arctic ice is growing and has been growing since 2012. It's certainly not disappearing. Um, what was the other one? Um, somebody remind me. Shout. Sorry? Oh, the coral. GBR just been reported as a maximum extent ever recorded since, since measurements began. Um, so there you are. And um, down on the left, we've done that. I think we can move on. From, sorry, I just need to go and look. So what does that all mean for the comparison between the weather and the weather forecast? or in this case, the climate and the climate forecast. Um, the forecasts are plotted by the University of Huntsville, Alabama and taken to the Senate on a regular basis in the US. And the, all of them are the dotted lines going up there. Um, and there's a red line, which is their average. The reality from the satellites are the, I think, blue and the green and the purple lines at the bottom, they're satellites and balloons. So the error there is about 250% or, as I like to call it, one Ferguson. Um, <laughs> I've got some other units like that, but I'll keep them to myself for the minute. Um, next slide, please. What am I talking about? Oh, CO2. Correlation, you can just look at this. This is the correlation between CO2 and temperature if you don't just look at over, over the last 30 years or so and forget about the fact that the last 24 have been pretty flat. Um, there isn't a correlation. There are times in the past when, in fact, there's a time in between 1939 and 1972 when temperatures came down 0.6 of a degree while so CO2 was busily going up. And if you look back in the past, uh, let's think of another one naturally, the, the hippos in Honiton, we used to have hippopotamuses in the Thames in the last period like this, the last interglacial, um, and at that time it was four degrees warmer, generally it's six degrees warmer than now. Um, CO2 levels were 290 parts per million, so lower than they are now. It, it really doesn't relate. So there really isn't good evidence for correlation, and I think I'll, oh, <laughs> and on the right hand side is the real killer. If you get down to 150 parts per million, so let's say you suck a load of CO2 out of the atmosphere now and it gets down to 200, and you then go into an ice age, the oceans absorb more carbon dioxide as they are currently giving it out as they warm, and we all die. <laughs> now, as Pierre Gosselin, who's a commentator in this area, has pointed out, if you are running out of petrol, worrying about having too much is a really bad idea. You know, you're all going to die. So what should you really worry about is the point. Um, next slide, please. Aha. This is hard to explain, actually. Um, I've struggled with this in the car several times on the motorway again. Um, we are now told that in order to reduce CO2, we should go back to using the energy sources that powered us through the feudal agrarian 
times when it wasn't too good for most people. The elites were fine, but we were just carbohydrate power because there was no steam power. There was no other power than windmills, water mills, people, and draft animals. And if you wanted more power and more food, you went and conquered somebody else and enslaved them. It was quite simple. And then all of a sudden, somebody invented steam power, hugely intense and powered by coal. And then later, by, then later we developed gas boilers and then nuclear boilers to make the steam with. And that gave us, and this is a really important point, you just need to, I, I have to keep saying this because it's so obvious, I don't do it. The only way you can have a developed economy and live like we are now is if you have cheap, plentiful energy available to the people. If the people do not have cheap, plentiful energy, they are impoverished and basically run by elites, and you haven't got a democracy anymore. <laughs> Which means you need to stop the act, um, or get out of the UN IPCC and everything else. Except, of course, I've written pages of guff here to read, which I will have a quick go at going through quickly. I'll try to summarise in words what I hope I've given you a rough idea of the, the science supporting. Okay? So, only if most people... I'm answering the question that I asked in the title. The Energy and Climate Change Act, back, does the Back to the Future work? Only if most people live in far greater poverty than the reduced levels of energy used imposed by climate law can support. This is not the levelling up those who supported the government's green future expected or voted for. It's levelling down. Imposing feudal energy sources will add tens of billions, is adding tens of billions, per annum in subsidy costs to their electricity bills by law, made worse by taxing what works better and cheaper to make it uncompetitive. How funny is that? Then banning it because CO2. So what works, you can't have. You can only have what they impose on you. The green and pleasant land of feudal energy will be anything but for the masses. Great for elites with near absolute power over the increasing energy poor. Mistake. Which is why we stopped using, and this is why we stopped using wind and water in the early days of, of our development. So government now forces these energy sources on us by law. Why would they do that? For profit. All this is in the name of reducing the emissions of CO2, a natural gas on which life on Earth depends, from which we and plants are made, which is at near record low into glacial levels and whose measured effect on surface temperatures is almost undetectable, as we've seen. Our ignorant politicians have labelled CO2 a dangerous pollutant, really, to justify their energy fraud. I mean, how credible is that? claiming a climate emergency that's not happening in measured fact. Rather the opposite. While their well-funded activist green shirts abuse those pointing out the inconvenient truths. Why would they do that? Uh, if you can't have a debate, and the point there, of course, is you can't, if you have questions that can't, answers that can't be questioned, you have a real problem. It gets worse, I wrote. More bizarrely, the Act also supports paying billions of our money to bury CO2, the stuff that the planet increasingly sequesters naturally and permanently, that's in limestone and chalk, to profit its crony lobbyists, including the person who wrote the Act. You can't really make it up. <laughs> that's truly a corruption of delusional science invented for the purpose. I'm mad. The Act cannot deliver its stated objectives and will cost us about... Uh, and we can talk about this number outside. One billion dollars for each millionth of a degree that it changes, it could remediate. And that's on the science that the IPCC uses. Um, while the major emitters do nothing of significance to reduce CO2. Okay, that's China, India, blah, blah. Except manufacture the fraudulent renewable instruments of our own destruction. Power, powered by their mainly coal-fired power stations, adding value by using energy we could have used to do it better ourselves. So we become a client state that they now de facto control by extracting and consuming the same energy to make our stuff that we denied ourselves by law. To gain the wealth from the value they add, and they get the wealth from the value they add, and we don't. No emissions were saved. 
where, where, is there any, where is there any sense in that? The justification for imposing the act has been disproven on the clear measurements of nature, which we've covered, by the most advanced satellite system, yet the act's climate action is sustained at huge pointless and growing costs. Why? Um, the inevitable effects are now overtly exposed by COVID and Putin. It's sort of, he precipitated it. It's not the cause. We've been denied the adequate, adequate affordable energy supply we need by our own law when our economy totally depends on it. Um, as our cost of energy rises, our poverty grows. Not because it has to, but because of the act. Now, laws based on forced demonstra demonstration of the natural products of combustion, sorry, forced demonization of the pro natural products of combustion, CO2, on which all life depends, to intentionally deny people the essential product of that combustion, the cheap, plentiful energy on which all modern life depends. Did I repeat myself there? No, I didn't. Back to the future can't work because its premise is false. Now, so be in no doubt, climate action will really, really make our kids' lives much less prosperous and freer than were our own. Um, I think the basic democratic freedoms that cheap, plentiful energy has given us are being removed by climate law because CO2. What we can buy, what we can do, where and, where and how we can do it, what we can even say, even to determine what our money can be invested in. I got the letter today from my investment house saying we're not going to invest in things that produce carbon dioxide. Yeah, by their ESG law. The real emergency is an energy emergency caused by the e Energy the Act and a clear and present repression of our democratic freedoms by the state to impose the Act. Let's, let us decide what we buy with our money at the time we need it to the market conditions that then apply. Politicians cannot and must not be allowed to pick winners. Heat pumps should compete with gas boilers, EVs with ICVs, and without compulsion, without subsidy. So, I suggest to you, back to the future can't work. The science says no. We need the cheapest plentiful energy we can get, when we need it, how we need it, to empower our lives and our economy to the maximum extent possible. And as much of that as can be from sovereign resources at prices we can control and afford. It can be done. When do we want it? <laughs> well, soonish anyway. Thank you. So back to the future can't work and the act must go. And I commend these facts and ideas to your further study and to the Reform Party who already support them. Thanks for your attention, and that ends my lesson.